So thank you very much for making the time um, to come. I will try and share the experience that we have in sickle cell disease to try and see whether hematology, and obviously I'm biased because I work in hematology, how hematology can provide scientific solutions for global health. I'll talk about it from the perspective of clinical science, and then um, Christina will talk about it from the perspective of basic science. So um, this morning I spoke to um, Shani, who is the mother of these two children. Um, both of them have sickle cell disease, therefore, um, and it's been quite a stormy um, um, it, cause of illness. And she contacted me earlier this year saying, we heard that there's transplant and we heard that there's gene therapy for cure. Can we get the cure? So I spoke to colleagues here at, at Joseph de la Fuente who does gene therapy and transplant. I spoke to other key, um, colleagues um, as part of the multidisciplinary team. But clearly it was very, very difficult for us to sort something out for them. They then um, are now in, in India where they're going to get um, matched unrelated um, donor transplants to try and address the problem that they have. It's pertinent. Last week, the FDA in the US approved um, the first gene therapy trial for, for sickle cell disease. It has complications, it has lots of issues, but it's there. It costs close to $2 million. So it clearly means that transplant and gene therapy, curative, but it will not be a solution for the population. And when we talk to the ministries of health in countries, when we talk to WHO, the burden of sickle cell disease, and this is work that has recently been published in the Lancet Hematology, and thank you, Lalan, for being here, in that we estimate that there are about 5 million people with sickle cell disease in the world. So clearly it's not practical to expect that we'll be able to address the problem of sickle cell disease with gene therapy or um, transplant now. The priority for now, and I'll mention this here, is that for the individuals that we know have sickle cell disease, and so far we have a, 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 um, a Pan-African study where we're working in eight countries, we've been able to identify at least 34,000, fraction of them, but we want to make sure that at least for these individuals who have sickle cell disease and we've identified, we can give them a disease-modifying medicine, and that is hydroxyurea. So for the past three years, we've been working with work that we've done with Lucho in Tanzania, working with the WHO Afro, really trying to advocate for access to hydroxyurea, which is the medicine that works. It's cheap. You um, take it orally. So really, most patients or all patients, the recommendations and evidence is there, should be on um, hydroxyurea. So really, as physician scientists, we have to work at trying to address a problem in an individual or in a patient who says, I would like, despite all the complications, I would like and I will facilitate um, um, processes, but I want to transplant or I want to participate in gene therapy. And yet at the same time, we have to work with the majority of people who require something as basic as hydroxyurea, and we need to make sure that that is available. So really trying to deal with the two extremes. And so when we look at it, the approach, and I like this, um, this that shows almost a continuum, is that we should do both. We should make sure that we improve and we optimize access to hydroxyurea. And ironically, we're talking with Stephen um, over the past two days, when you look at hydroxyurea, for instance, in the UK, it's available through the NHS, but there are other factors that make it difficult for patients to get onto, onto it. Whereas in places like Tanzania, um, Uganda, it's not available, so there are different issues. The key thing is that we want to make sure that all people are on um, disease modding because it does improve their quality of life and it does reduce uh, mortality. At the same time, we want to optimize because we cannot stop individuals, patients, countries, health systems who say we want to provide bone marrow transplant for those who want um, transplant. And we would like to participate in gene therapy um, trials at the moment. It's ex vivo, but we want to do that. Ultimately, the long term goal, which when I'm feeling optimistic, I hope it's in the next five years. When I'm being more realistic, it's in the next 10, 15 years, is in vivo gene therapy, because then we wouldn't have to deal with the transplant. We would just give an injection, and then we'd be able to get um, the, the, um, the patients cured. So our approach, <clears throat> and this is one of the first questions from a clinical epidemiological perspective, is really being able to characterize and say, what causes anemia? Is it a big 
problem? Is it a significant problem? And obviously the answer is yes, but it hasn't really been characterized. So we've worked in Tanzania and we're now working in seven um, countries in Africa and we'll be working with colleagues here in the UK so that we can compare. Does the epidemiology differ? And if it does differ, how does it differ? What are the things that we need to look at to understand the different sickle cell populations from an epidemiological perspective in the different geographical um, locations that we're looking at? And so it's really describing detailed descriptive epidemiology being able to look at what are the interventions that work, what are the interventions that don't work, and what are the outcomes. Ultimately, the goal is to improve outcomes and um, with time, cure disease. The second area is really understanding genomics um, of sickle cell disease. When the Human Genome Project was completed, this is now over 20 years ago, we were concerned in Africa that we would not be able to have access to um, the, the genomic capacities. And thank you to uh, um, um, Professor Mark Walport and, and, and um, Dr. Francis Collins, the NIH invested through H3 Africa in building genomic research capacity in Africa. Over the past 11 years, we've been able to address the issues around regulatory, data access, bioinformatics capacity, and really being able, utilizing H3 Africa to build capacity, but also start addressing the clinical phenotypes, the, um, the um, genotyping, looking and seeing what would be the most appropriate way of answering these questions. And it has been, we have been able to build capacity to now start answering more detailed questions. A really important um, phenotype is fetal hemoglobin, because we know that this is something that really influences um, disease severity. If you have high levels of fetal hemoglobin, you have less severe disease. And they're only, um, it's genetically determined, and only three factors have been um, described up until um, two years ago, and they account for less than 20% of the genetic variability of fetal hemoglobin. Lucho and Florence in Tanzania, collaborating with colleagues here in, at King's, have been able to describe a fourth um, genetic loci um, on, on the X chromosome, which is associated with this. And so we think that through global collaboration, we'll be able to identify, validate, um, and, 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 and discover new loci that can then be um, targets potentially for um, therapy. I think I've been here as, as Provost Visiting Professor at Imperial for the past seven months, and it's really been an honor to be back here. I trained here as a junior doctor 26 years ago, and so it's been really great coming back. And one of the things that struck me really about, um, about the potential for gene therapy here in the UK is that the first patient who, in the UK who has been cured of HIV was actually cured here at the Hammersmith with a transplant that was provided by the Department of Hematology under the leadership of Professor Eduardo Olavaria. The capacity is here. Um, colleagues are working to develop um, bone, um, bone marrow transplant <clears throat> services for adults with sickle cell disease, and this will be an opportunity for us to participate in gene therapy trials here in the UK. We've also been um, um, working with, with colleagues, and this is a photograph here, of <clears throat> Tassos in the lab, really looking at the work that they're doing. Granted, it's in my myeloma, but looking at all the um, work that is ongoing with regards to cellular therapy, with regards to understanding immunology, because these are all questions that we don't have the answers with regards to what happens in people who receive gene therapy. Will it work? Will it not work? What are the immunological um, um, issues that we need to address? What are the erythropoietic responses that we should expect. And therefore, we need to be able to look beyond hematology, with, even within hematology, other areas of hematology, and we need to work and look beyond, because there's quite a lot that has already been um, discovered um, and, and, and described in conditions such as HIV or, or other areas. And so it's really combining the clinical capacity that is here, not just at the Hammersmith, but also in, in, in the UK, the, the um, um, laboratory, and, and, and Christina will talk about this a lot, the expertise that is already there to see how we can do this. This is Adam. Um, he will probably arrive um, later, but he is known as the London patient, and he is the patient who was cured from HIV with a transplant. And he, we work together in a global gene therapy initiative as an effort to kind of see what are the things that we need to address in Africa 
and in India to make sure that we participate in gene-based therapy for sickle cell disease and HIV. As part of the work that we've been doing um, here, and this is work that really leverages um, work that has already been here, is really engaging the patient community. You'll hear um, a little bit um, later from Zainab, really saying that as patients, we need to make sure that they're part of the process and not just study participants, but they are part of the whole scientific endeavor. And so we've been working as Imperial to make sure that they come, they see what it is that we're doing in the labs, they see what it is that we're doing in the wards when it comes to science. I'll now switch. So we've talked about the platforms that are available, clinical platforms and the potential. We've talked about the patients and the importance of engaging patients and, 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 and the public. And then the final thing is really policy. So we are not able to do anything if we do not have it as part of policy. We can work for 20 years, 30 years. If it's not part of policy, it means that when an individual leaves or when people leave, the system has the potential of breaking down. And so there are experiences in Brazil, in the US, in the UK, where you've seen fantastic services available. And then after 15, 10 years, for various reasons, there has been a deterioration in, in the quality. So how do we ensure that the quality does not change? It's really engaging with policy. So this is a photograph of um, um, Janet um, Dabi, who's, who's the chair of um, the all party parliamentary group when um, I think it was earlier this month um, when or last month when the Lancet Commission um, on Sickle Cell Disease, Lancet Hematology Commission was launching the report on sickle cell disease. And this is really important because by having it talked at at that level, it really brings it to the attention of policymakers addressing the needs that need to be made. The National Hemoglobinopathy Panel, the UK is one of the few places who are working at national level and bringing together clinicians, um, healthcare providers, researchers to address sickle cell disease from different aspects. And um, Dr. Baba Inusa, um, who is chairing that, will be, will be here. And then finally, it's really policy and partnerships. How can we partner as countries between, for instance, the Tanzania and the UK. And this is a photograph where we had the, the permanent secretary from the uh, Ministry of Health in Tanzania coming, visiting Imperial, having in, in engagement and discussions with, with um, politicians, but uh, academics as well, to kind of say, what are the things that we need to put in place as policymakers to make sure that the partnerships are at not just at institutional level, but are at, um, at um, national level. And then in terms of the gene therapy, I mentioned the H3 Africa, which, which um, we started in 2011. And in 2017, the first patient was cured from sickle cell disease using gene therapy in France. And the government turned to us and said, of Tanzania, and said, we really believe in this, um, in, in, in cure. And we would like to see what are the things that we need. We may not be able to do everything at the same time, but potentially we need to start putting things in place now to do that. And so if you move to, and, and this was at government level in Tanzania, but also in, in 2019 at the African Union during um, one of the Gates Challenges meeting, the NIH and the Gates Foundation committed $100 million each to invest in gene-based therapy for sickle cell and HIV in Africa. And so there is interest, there is opportunity to do that. And what we've done in Tanzania and in many other African countries is to make sure that what we do from a genetic perspective or trying to do that is the majority, as I said, the majority will need care and they need care at primary, secondary um, level. And they need basic things, including hydroxyurea. So we made sure that sickle cell disease is included in the national policy for non-communicable diseases. The implementation of that has started has its challenges, but at least we're on the right path that we know that it's in the policy. So when they're reporting about HIV or about TB, they will also report about non-communicable diseases, including sickle. And then we've started advanced therapy programs and only three countries in Africa have, south of Sahara, have bone marrow transplant units. It's not just sickle individuals who need this, it's other hematological conditions. And so South Africa, Nigeria, and um, last year, Tanzania was able to set up um, bone marrow transplant facilities in two. This is important because it will mean that instead of our patients having to leave Tanzania, having to leave the continent and going to get transplant 
elsewhere. They can get transplants in Tanzania, and it means, one, it's cheaper, or in Africa, one, it's cheaper, and two, it means that we can provide service to a lot more. If you go to India for a transplant, it's $100,000. If we are able to do it, where, as we're able to do it, it costs between twenty dollars to um, um, $50,000, dollars to $50,000 if we're able to do this, and we think that that price can go down. The advantage of this is that we are improving service from primary, secondary level, but also try to optimize care so that patients can receive. But more importantly, or and more importantly, is that bone marrow transplant is the platform for participating in ex vivo gene therapy, which is something that we need to do. Of the $200 million that was invested um, five years ago, none of it came to Tanzania, none of it came to Africa. And so as part of the global gene therapy, it's really trying to address this gap, is that you cannot have a situation where you have the bulk of the disease in one geographical area and the research occurring in another area and then not addressing the health issues that need to be addressed, whether access to hydroxyurea and not um, um, making sure that that's in place whilst you're working on, on, on um, gene therapy. I think finally, it's really encouraging and trying to get us to really partner in terms of at institutional level, but partnering with various people in science and in health. So we've been working, and, and I do apologize because the ambassador is not able to, to, to um, join us this afternoon, but um, they've been extremely supportive as um, um, the government in terms of looking and seeing what are the science issues that we need to address when it comes to at policy level and when it comes to health. We've been working and are working with the WHO in, 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 um, in Africa, as well as the WHO globally, to kind of make sure that sickle cell disease is addressed. And we're very um, um, opportunistic. If there's an opportunity in non-communicable diseases, we will work with them. If there's an opportunity, um, so a year ago, to, a year and a half ago, um, there was a WHO science council looking to see what are the issues that we need to, um, to, to address in order to accelerate access to genomic technologies, we make sure that we participate. Because having conversations about that means that we can then start coming up with a roadmap to implement this. And then partnering with industry, you know, how do we make hydroxyurea accessible? Cheap supply is, is, is there, and we need to engage the people who make this initially, making sure that the supply is, is, is adequate, and then with time, address the manufacturing. We've done a point of, uh, a proof of principle in, in, in Africa to show that we can produce um, hydroxyurea. A, a company in Nigeria is producing it. So this is something that really just needs, to a certain extent, political will. And then philanthropy and financing agencies, because we do need to address um, the, the access. We cannot have a situation where you have um, tech, um, interventions available and they're not accessible to the bulk of the, of the individuals. Um, I think this is my final slide, is really just one of the things that I always um, try and remind myself and try and encourage others to remind is at the end of the day, why, why is it that we pursue science? Why is it that we do what it is that we try to do? And this really has to feed back and has to touch the patients who have the disease to make sure that we can say directly or indirectly, but this is something that should be on our minds as scientists, as, 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 um, as health. How is what I'm doing, how does that translate to improving the health of an individual with sickle cell disease or with a disorder? So I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>